Okay, so as I was saying, uh, if for those of us who are able to attend the pilot mentorship or career talk last week, um, you know Dr. Hassan, but uh, for those of us who are not there, I'll just introduce him really fast. So Dr. Hassan has quite an extensive CV, mashallah. So he did his undergrad in Turkey and he obtained his MD there. He then worked as an MO in Machako, Susiolo and Garissa. He then came back and did his MED at UN um, from 2008 to 2012. From there, he worked as a physician at Susiolo from 2012 to 2018. He then did his cardiology fellowship from 2018 to 2021. So currently he's working as a physician cardiologist at Nairobi South Hospital and is a visiting um, consultant at Isiolo Hospital. He's also undertaking interventional procedures at Greenwich Cat Lab. So mashallah, tabarakallah, that's uh, quite impressive see, uh, for you, Doc. Um, so I'm just gonna let you um, start right away. Um, if there's anything I missed, or we can just go ahead and start with the session directly. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. Um... Uh, two things. Number one, first of all, I am not sure the participants, the level, are they used to, all of them fifth years, fourth years, third years, or is a mixture? I So that, uh, you know, it's good to balance. I don't know where to start because my earlier program was to just do basics because we have a lot of time, inshallah. Hopefully, I want you guys to grasp the whole concept of ECG. So I'll start from the basics. Maybe some gets, some guys may get bored saying that ah, this is too basic. But I thought I'll start from basics. Then the next thing we'll go to is um, uh, today I'm thinking of starting the basics. Then probably we discuss rate, rhythm, and axis. Then we stop there. Then in the next session, we'll start from now the waves, from P wave all the way to U wave. We'll study each one and what do they represent and the pathologies that they, they, they mean. And then the third session of a series will be now specific ones like arrhythmias. It will be a topic on its own how to identify the various arrhythmias all the way from atrial fibrillation to sinus bradycardia to AV block. And then finally, the other session will be uh, on specifically acute coronary syndrome, ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction. And probably in that same session, we'll also finish the miscellaneous, the ones which are important. So I wanted to know the distribution of the, of the participants. Uh, I hope I'll not bore some people with too much basics. And I hope I will not be too fast for those probably who are in third year. So I don't know what do you what do you suggest or what do you think? Uh, we have uh, students from all levels joining us, so we just go with the basics. I think it's okay. You can never okay. learn the basics okay. too. Okay, and then the other thing, of course, is uh, we are starting now at seven twenty, probably by. Uh, I don't want to, to bore guys also. So by 8.30 will be done. I think I'll give like one hour and then so that we just go very slowly. And inshallah, when we bump into each other in the corridors of Kenyatta, you can stop me. The, the ideal thing I had told the vice chair is physical uh, presentation so that you can see the actual ECG. But unfortunately, circumstance not allowing us. But inshallah, I hope one day we'll be able to arrange uh, the physical meeting. So now let me start. and. Um, Inshallah, please. I don't know now how 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 should we handle the issue of questions. Uh, the questions. Yes. I think anybody who has a question can just write in the chat, and then uh, you will you'll ask. Okay. Yes. All right. So thank you. So let me start. Inshallah. Bismillah. So um um. First of all, I just want to introduce the basics, uh, how the electricity is conducted in the heart. And uh, this is very important because once you know the, the, the electric conduction of the heart, then ECG becomes very, very easy. Uh, so before you go to the, to the nitty gritty details of interpreting ECG and conducting an ECG, just a quick reminder of the electric conduction system of the, of the heart. Uh, are you able to see my arrow yeah? So I'll be repeating this quite often, but just a quick reminder, uh, as you are aware, we have got the electrical system of the heart and the myocardium, so that the heart is a pump. And for it to pump, it requires some form of energy and the energy comes in the form of electricity. Um, what you call electromechanical coupling. And in the right atrium, 
at a certain junction between the, there's something called the crystal ovalis up there above the tricuspid valve is a structure known as the sinoatrial node. And that's actually where the whole thing begins. Just remember that every single cell in the heart has a capability of generating electricity, what you call automaticity. It's basically a characteristic of the heart. But the senior atrial node is the main pacemaker because of the nature of its physiology, the way it's able to generate electricity. Uh, of course, we will not go into too much details that I'll ask you to refer to basic physiology books. But just remember, it is the main senior atrial node. The senior atrial node is a pacemaker because its firing ability is different. The electrolytes which it uses to generate electricity it's, it is, is different. And that's why, for example, in the treatment of certain, um, for example, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, we have a new drug called Evabradine. Uh, it blocks specifically certain cells which are found or channels which are found in the sinoatrial atrial node. So once the electricity has been generated in the sinoatrial atrial node, before the other cells downwards generate any electricity, the sinoatrial atrial node fires. And whenever a certain focus of the heart generates electricity, all the other ones are usually suppressed because of what you call refractoriness. So when the senior atrial node fires electricity, obviously electricity spreads in the atrium very fast, especially at the beginning in the right atrium, then immediately in the left atrium. And there are bundles that tie them. They have different names, but it's not important for you guys for now. Now, once the electricity has reached the both atria, the atria contracts. And the purpose of electricity, I told you, is just to generate enough energy so that uh, the muscles contract. And in the process of contracting, once the atria has contracted, the valves will open and blood is being drawn into, into the ventricles. And so that when there's atrial systole, the ventricles are in diastole. The ventricles are relaxing. Their work is to receive blood because you cannot have the atria and the ventricle contracting at the same time. So how does that happen? How do we make sure that the atria and ventricle don't contract at the same time? So when the senior atrial node generates the electricity, it comes to the AV node. So the AV node is the only allowed uh, connection, electric connection between the atria and ventricle. The rest of it is surrounded by an insulator, a kind of a fibroelastic structure. And that's why later on when you discuss arrhythmias, we have what you call pre-excitation syndromes like wolf parkinson white syndrome, because there the atria is directly connected to the, to, the, to the ventricle and it bypasses the normal route, which is the AV node. So when the electricity has been generated, it comes to the AV node and at the AV node, the electricity is held for like some few seconds, maximum around 200 milliseconds, okay? And the purpose of doing that is to allow the atrium to contract so that it can empty its blood into the ventricles. By that 0 0.2 seconds, which is like 200 milliseconds, the atria has done its work and now it is the atria diastole. In other words, the atria will start now relaxing to receive blood from either the pulmonary system in the case of the left, vent left atrium or the systemic circulation in case of the right atrium. In that particular time, electricity now is transmitted downwards through the his bundle and the his bundle immediately it comes up here where my arrow is at the beginning of the interventricular septum is divided into two branches. One is called the left bundle branch and the other one is called the right bundle branch. The left bundle branch is divided into two more sub branches, what you call fascicles. So we have got the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle. And all these things are very important because later on you'll hear of what you call hemi block, you'll hear of bundle branch blocks and so forth. Now, ultimately, um, Somebody is raising her hands. We okay or? Are you hearing me? I'm, 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 I'm breaking. Uh, we, can, we can hear you. I think you can just okay. continue. So let me continue. So when the electricity now comes, so remember the AV node, the his bundle is divided into two left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. The left bundle branch is divided into anterior fascicle and posterior fascicle. Now the anterior fascicle, the posterior fascicle and the right bundle branch, these are still cables of electricity. They are still delivering the energy. And the final target is the myocardium, which is the muscle of the heart. So how does that happen? The ultimate final fine branches, which now terminate into the muscles are called the Purkinje fibers. 
And once it reaches the Purkinje fibers, because they are in close contact with myocardium, and because of the property of syncytium, the muscles contract at the same time, and that's what you call ventricular systole, so that the right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary system, and the left ventricle pumps blood into the into the into the left uh, into the aorta. So this, the next few slides is basically a summary of on the the image on the left coming from the image on the right is now what is demonstrated electrically on the surface of the patient. So the first thing that happens is the atrial contraction. And in the ECG, the atrial contraction is shown by the P wave. So when the atria is contracting on the image on the left, what is shown on the electrical surface, which is the ECG, which is our talk of the day, is the P wave. I will see this later again and again and again. Now, once the atria has contracted, the next thing that happens is electricity is a little bit stopped at the AV node. And that AV node, the his bundle, that region is demonstrated in the ECG by what you call the PR segment, not interval. Interval is a different thing. So the first letter is P. The second letter, the second area is the PR segment, which is demonstrated by this yellow spot, which is the AV node. And I told you the purpose of holding electricity here is to allow the atria to contract, empty its blood into the diast and to the ventricles so that you don't have a situation where the atria and the ventricle are contracting at the same time. Then after that, electricity is transmitted through the ventricles, through the his Purkinje fiber system. And this is represented by the QRS, and now the QRS complex is what represents the ventricular depolarization when the, uh, the ventricles are contracting. Then we have got an area called the ST segment, which is called a silent area. It's a very important component. We'll see what it means. And finally, the T wave, which is representing ventricular repolarization. This is another summary again. How is the impulse conducted? From the sinoatrial node, it comes to the AV node, and then it's held there for some time. Then from there, it goes to the bundle of his. The bundle of his is divided into two, the bundle branch left and right, and the bundle branch is further divided into, uh, the left bundle branch is divided into anterior, posterior, but the ultimate fibers that come into contact with the muscles is what you call the Purkinje fibers. This is again, another representation. Basically, this is the pacemaker of the heart. And whenever the upper pacemaker fails, the lower pacemaker takes over. For example, a patient who has got sinoatrial nodal block or sinus bradycardia for whatever reason, if the sinus, the sinoatrial node pacemaker cells fail to fire an electricity, the responsibility is taken over by the other cells in the atrium. If that particular atria for whatever reason is not able to generate electricity, then it's taken over by the AV node. And as you go down the line, the heart rate becomes lower and lower and lower. That's why a patient who has got, for example, complete heart block, their heart rate is the range of 30s or something like that. Because the sinoatrial node is the fastest and it fires at a rate of between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So what is an ECG? Uh, basically, as I told you, this thing is electricity. So it's an electric energy that's being supplied to the muscles of the heart, which eventually leads to contraction and therefore pumping of the blood. It's as simple as that. Now this electrical activity taking place in the heart, when you record it on the surface of the body is what you call electric cardiogram. So you, electrocardiography is the technology of doing it. The final thing which we print out, which we give to the patient is what you call electrocardiogram, okay? And how does it work? So basically, as I've demonstrated, electrical impulse is picked by the placing electrodes and electrodes, as you remember from physics, it basically measures, measures the difference in electron transfer from the negative to the positive. You remember electricity flows from negative pod, I mean, uh, pole to another. And as the electric impulse travels towards a positive electrolyte, it will result in a positive deflection. We'll see in the next slides when we'll talk about uh, what you call the anatomy of the ECG paper. But if the impulse moves away from the positive electrode, then it gives a negative deflection. And this is what I mean. So that, for example, later on, we'll see how the leads are placed. When an electricity is flowing towards a lead, it deflects positively. This line is called the isoelectric line, which is the horizontal line. Anything above it, you call it positive deflection. Anything below it, we call it negative deflection. For example, for this lead, 
electricity is flowing away from it and therefore it has a negative deflection. But since it is moving towards it, it's causing a positive deflection. If, for example, the electric flow is parallel to the lead, then the lead will not have neither positive nor negative deflection. So it will remain isoelectric, okay? And how much it travels faster towards it, the, the taller the peak. Like for example, this one also, the electricity is flowing towards it, but when you compare this lead two and lead one, there's a difference. Lead one, you can see the, the wave is tall because the amount of muscles in that side, which is attracting the electricity and therefore resulting in the contraction, it's quite high. Now, when it comes to the electric, uh, the ECG, there are different types of leads. The one which we'll talk about today is what you call the 12 lead ECG. Although it is 12 lead, and I will tell you where this 12 is coming from, when you go to the wards, the actual number of leads you are putting on the patient, they are actually 10. Four on the limb leads, and, uh, and um, three on the, four on the lip leads, and, and six on the, what you call the chest leads. So although, although we call them, although we call them, um, although we call them 12 of lead ECG, in reality, when you go to the ward and when you see a patient has got 10 leads or rather 10 things being fixed on his body, don't be surprised. The reason is because the four limb leads, which we connect to the four limbs, will act like as if they are six. So when we talk of the leads, we divide them into two, actually. We have got the limb leads and the chest leads. Another way of classifying is bipolar and unipolar, but that one will confuse you. So the best way to remember is limb leads and chest leads or precordial leads. You can use whichever word you want to use. And when the ECG paper comes out in some papers, you will write written C1, C2, C3, or others are written V1, V2, V3. So the Vs and the Cs, they mean the same thing, is the precordial leads or the chest leads. There are six of them. For the limb leads, we have got lead one, which is written in Roman number like this, sorry, Arabic number, lead one, lead two, and lead three. And then we have got AVL, AVR, AVF. The A is small because it means augmented. In other words, the electricity which is being captured by these leads is so, so, so small that the machine has to magnify for us to see it on the paper. That's why we use the small letter A. And VL means the, it's, it's usually on the left limb, upper limb, the right upper limb and the left foot, okay? But now when you are connecting the patient to the 12 lead ECG, in which I told you is actually 10 leads, there's a black one. So usually one is red, one is blue, a green, one is yellow, and the other one is black. The black one is neutral. We usually put it on the right foot, okay? And you can put it on the foot depending on the kind of ECG leads you have. So what I will urge you all of you guys is in the next few days, so that you can grasp these limb leads and whatever, just be curious, go to one of the ECGs, try to get at the leads and look at the color coding and what they mean, whether it's V1, V2, V3, where do you usually put them? Now, the next thing I want to discuss is where do you place them? So this representation may a little bit confuse you, but just remember the one which is marked red, which is usually the right one, we put it on the right arm. So you can put it either in the form of a clip, you can put, put it in the form of uh, uh, basically what you call adhesive electrodes, depending on the ECG you have. Then we have got yellow, which is usually on the left arm. Then we have got green, which is usually on the left foot and black on the right foot. Those are the four limb leads which you'll see in the words, okay? Now we have got the, 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 the chest leads, which are called chest leads or precordial leads. So how you'll identify is, I'm sure all of you guys, you know the notch, which is called the suprasternal notch. Then below it, there is a ridge. All of you can feel your own ridge. So this is called the Louis or angle of Louis. Now at the level of our angle of Louis, the intercostal space below it is number two. So you count there two, three, four. So at the fourth intercostal space on the right is where you put your lead V1 or C1. Then directly opposite, meaning fourth intercostal space on the left side is where you will put your V2. Now V3, you jump, you come to V4 where you will put exactly where you are feeling the point of maximal impulse, what you call the PMI. 
Now between lead two and lead three, right way in between is where you put your V3. V5 and V6 is usually parallel to where V4 is. You just continue going in the same length, but one of them is usually in the mid axillary line and the other one is the posterior axillary line. So I want you to be practicing this list these things where to place those leads, they are very important. Because if you put, for example, a lead where it's not supposed to be, then you may get a different uh, wave and to interpret may be a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing I wanted to discuss, how to, dis how to place the leads. And please keep on practicing the words so that as time go by, you know these things now become part and parcel of you. When the ECG is printed, now the final thing which is in your hand, it usually appears like this. So lead one, lead two, lead three, they appear like this. Then the argumented leads AVL, AVR, AVL, AVF. Then from V1 all the way to V6, this is how it's actually arranged. And this will make your work easy because later on when you are discussing uh, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, so that you can localize lesions, we know which lead is where and which part of the heart is it looking at, okay? So, when it's usually generated like this, at the bottom here, there is something called a rhythm lead. So you'll have these ones, for example, maybe they're around five waves like that, but this will be a tall, a long one, which is usually printed at the bottom. And that's what you call the, the rhythm lead or the rhythm strip. Most of the ECGs, they use lead two. The reason is because it's the only one that's parallel to the electric flow of the heart, but some other, some other ECGs, they like using V1 as a rhythm strip. So whether you use V1 or lead two, basically it appears at the bottom of the ECG and it's a very, very long one. And that one is very important because it's the one that you will be able to use to calculate rate, it's the one that will be able to determine the rhythm of the heart. It will be the one that will be able to tell us the various intervals so and so forth. So it's a very, very, very important strip. So this is how it appears on the ECG paper. Now, after br that brief introduction of ECG, um, I wanted to mention some, something I forgot is YPQRST. So there's a lot of story about it, but basically the history is that the gentleman who was, who, who won a body called Nobel, Nobel Prize for medicine, especially ECG is called William Enthoven. He's a Dutch physicist. And when he basically tried to measure electric activity of the heart, he just decided to start in the middle of the alphabets, the English alphabet, he just called it P. So some people will find when they are talking of the history of ECG in front of P, they put O, which is the isoelectric line just before the P wave. These are not important things, but why I'm saying this is if by any one of you discovers a wave in an ECG, you have to put it after U because P, Q, R, S, T, U has been taken. So you can only talk of V, W, X, Y, and Z. That is if you discover an, an, uh, a wave after that. So this, <clears throat> when you generate an electricity, I mean, uh, ECG, this is what you usually see. And it's not a must that all ECG waves should look like this. Sometimes they may not be P wave. The QRS may not be looking like this. There are different types of QRS. We'll see them, how they look like. The T wave may be notched, may be tall maybe flat, maybe inverted, it doesn't matter. But basically these are the waves that are very important. And as I've told you, number, the most important way, I mean, the first important wave is P wave, which tells you atrial contraction. Basically it represents from the SA node all the way to AV node. Therefore, what this means is, as we'll discover in the waves later on, anything to do with atria, whether it's atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, atrial enlargement, whatever, anything to do with atria, you will only concentrate on the P wave. You cannot talk of atria without talking of P wave, okay? Then after the P wave, there's an area called the PR. So from the beginning of P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex is called PR interval. But from the beginning, the end of P wave to the beginning of QRS is called PR segment. So PR segment is different from PR interval. PR interval is a time. We'll see later on how the, what this time means. But PR segment is just a region and each one has a different meaning. For example, PR interval is very, very, very important when it comes to electrophysiology, when it comes to heart blocks, so on and so forth. But PR segment, the only place it becomes important if, if you are talking of pericarditis. 
where you usually get PR segment depression. So PR segment is the end of P wave to the beginning of QRS. But if you're incorporating the entire P wave all the way to QRS, that one is called the PR interval. It tells you how much time it takes the electricity to generate to be generated in the atrium and to come all the way to the ventricles, including the AV node, how much time is it held, so on and so forth. It's not supposed to be more than 200 milliseconds. If it's more than that, we talk of prolonged PR interval and it has a meaning. After that, after the electricity has been held here for a brief period of time, to the ventricle so that the ventricle can, can, can contract. And therefore, the ventricular activity is represented by this complex called the QRS complex. And as you can see, it has a larger, a larger wave than the atrium because we all know that the walls of the, of, the, of the ventricle is usually thicker and bigger than the walls of the atrium. The atrium is very thin. And the thinner a chamber, the lesser electricity generates. And as we'll see later on in the subsequent ECGs, when you go towards V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, like that, as you go laterally, because that's where the left ventricle is, the amount of electricity or the precordial leads are usually higher. After the ventricle has contracted, now it's time to relax what you call ventricular repolarization. And that's usually represented from this region where the arrow is, which is the ST segment, all the way up to the T. Then after that, there's another interval called the QT interval. Now this QT interval is from the beginning of QRX complex all the way to end of T wave. And it tells you both ventricular depolarization and ventricular repolarization. And it's a very, very important interval, especially when it comes to certain drugs, when it comes to certain types of arrhythmias. Then finally, there's a wave which is called U wave, which is rarely seen, but it's very common in young people. So when you see a wave that is coming after the T wave and it is before the P wave, most likely you're dealing with U wave. And it's very important in certain electrolytes imbalances like hypokalemia. So remember the intervals again, P, Q, R, S, T. P is the atrial, Q, R, S is the, is the ventricular repolarization. ST segment is ventricular uh, repolarization. And the U wave is the one that comes after uh, the T wave. Now, the next thing I want to discuss is when you look at an ECG, there are grids. They are usually marked horizontally and vertically. Vertical tells us voltage. In other words, the amount of electricity being generated by the muscles is represented by the vertical height, while the horizontal, it's usually represented by time. Now, when you look at the marking, there is a very bold marking and there are smaller boxes inside. So the big one, which is uh, basically marked in bold, inside it contains five small boxes. This way five, vertical five. And each small box is one millimeter by one millimeter. So that horizontally, it represents a certain amount of time and vertically it tells you how much voltage is generated by, by the, the ventricle. Now, before I go into the anatomy of the, the anatomy of the, basically the timing and these things, always when you start to look at an ECG, there are numbers written down there. Always look at those numbers because those are called calibrations. And the standard ECG, which is commonly available all over the world and which most of you guys will come across, the speed, what you call the paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. It's usually written down there. That timing is very important because for us to calculate how much time is represented by this small box, it usually comes from the paper speed. So 25 millimeters per second means every second will be represented by zero point, a small box. In other words, if you mathematically, if you calculate it, a small box will be able to represent 0.04 second because the paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. In other words, one second is represented by 25 small boxes. So if I want to know the amount of time represented by one small box, it will be one out of 25, which gives me 0.04 seconds. That is the time represented by one small box. And because one large box has five small boxes, five times 0.04 will give you 0.2 seconds. So one large box horizontally represents a time of 0.2 seconds. These things are very important later on when you are calculating rate and, uh, and so on and so forth. So on this side, that's what I was trying to explain to you. 
so that this large grid, this is what I meant by the large boxes. For example, this is one large box. This is one, two, three, four, five. So this is vertical and this is horizontal. Horizontal is time. And every small box is representing 0.04 second. And I told you how the mathematically that was arrived at because the paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. And therefore, if one second is represented by 25 small boxes, because I told you each small box is one millimeter by one millimeter. The question is how many boxes, I mean, how much, how much, time is represented by one small box. So it will be one out of tw uh, 25, which will give you 0 0.04 seconds. Now 0 0.04, if you multiply by five small boxes, which is represented by one large box, it comes to uh, 0 0.2 millisecond, which is the same as uh, um, uh, basically yeah, 0.2 seconds, which is 200 milliseconds. You can use milliseconds, you can use seconds. This is just converting things uh, mathematically. What about the vertical representation? Again, there's another number that's usually written down there. And it will tell you 10 millimeter per millivolt or 10, sorry, 10 millivolts per millimeter. In other words, one small millimeter is represented by, is representing a certain percentage of millivolt. Just like this case, for example, five millimeters will represent 0 0.5 millivolt. And that's very important because when you are calculating for ventricular hypertrophy, right atrial enlargement, how big is the wave? You'll be able to use this number of small boxes and then you add up. You can even use numbers or you try using voltage. Mostly we like using numbers, but you can also use voltage. So in summary, this is the anatomy of an ECG. When you look at the paper, I had shown you previously, let me just go back. This is how it will appear, lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, AVL, AVF, and the six precordial leads. But apart from that, there are grids and representations. And these grids, horizontal is time, vertical is voltage. But before you conclude, ah, Osema, everything 0 0.0504, look at that ECG down there, what is it written? Is it written 10 millivolt per millimeter? If it's written like that, then that's standard. If it's written 25 millimeters per second, that's also standard. This is very, very important because later on when you are calculating the amount of hypertrophy or enlargement, now this will come in handy. This is just, again, another representation. Each small square will represent 0 0.4 millisecond, which is the same as 0 0.04 second, which is the same as 40 milliseconds. And each block, which is five, because it's 0 0.04 times five, will be represented by uh, five large boxes representing 0 0.2 seconds. Now, this other thing which is written in this slide here may not make sense to you right now, but as guys for cardiologists, for example, it's very important when you are implanting what you call pacemaker. So later on, when you are setting pacemaker, pacemaker does not understand the language of beats per minute. It doesn't understand. It only understands timing. So when you are adjusting, let's say, for example, I, we put a pacemaker on a patient. We want that patient to his heart or her heart to beat at 70 beats per minute. So the computer or the, the, the interrogator, which is a device which is used to set the pacemaker parameters, does not understand bits per minute. It only understands milliseconds. And this is what it tells you how to convert. But this is not, this is beyond your scope. Um, this we have already talked about, but let me just revisit again. So the first wave is P wave, which tells you about atrial contraction and it can be positive by phasic means it has two notches or it can be negative depending on which lead you are looking at. And that's why I, I wish that this was a physical meeting. I will have demonstrated to you the difference in P, P wave between V1 and V5. There is a difference between the two. And you can actually know that this is, this is the lead where it is located because of the shape of the P wave. But in summary, P wave tells you about atrial depolarization now the QRX complex can take different shapes because as much as some we talk of QRS, some leads may not have Q wave. Some lead may not have R wave. Some lead may have a deep S wave and a small R wave. So depending on how the wave look like, usually we name them accordingly because you can have a QS pattern, QS pattern. You can have RS pattern. You can have QR pattern. You can just have just a Q coming down, what you call the QS pattern, so on and so forth. But all the same, 
the first negative deflection after P wave is called Q. Thereafter, any positive deflection that comes after the first negative deflection will always be called R. So you'll hear of R, R prime, R prime two like that. There is no more negative. Even if there are several other positives, any other positive that comes after that's called R wave. Now, any negative deflection that comes after R wave is called S. So you can have S, S prime, S prime two like that. Then finally, you have the T wave, which represents uh, atrial repolar, I mean ventricular repolarization. I think up to there, basically it was a basic introduction to ECG, but I'll really, really urge you, all of you guys, whenever you have time, two, three of you, five of you, you can join hands. Just today, you just say, let's learn about this ECG. You start with the hardware. Don't go to the interpretation straight. Just learn the paper, the speeds, the timing, the leads, how to put it, and so on and so forth. Now, how do you interpret ECG? Just like any other thing, and this is a, 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 an attribute you should all learn. Don't, don't just go and say, ah, this atrial fibrillation. Because if you say that, you may miss a lot of things. Just like when you're reading an X-ray, you don't just say this cardiomegaly. You have to start the name of the patient, the time and the date it was taken. Was this technically done very well? I'm talking of ECG for, I mean, a chest X-ray, for example. Was it done technically the right way? Was it deep inspiration? Are the ribs well, whatever, uh, is the patient twisted? Basically, you look at the technical aspect, then have a format of approaching from outside to inside or inside outside. That's for chest X-ray. The same thing applies to ECG. The first thing you look is the name of the patient. If, for example, the name of the patient does not correspond with, because things can mix up, this is a medical uh, field and it has happened previously. The wrong patients have been taken to theaters almost their limbs chipped off or chopped off. So you may end up giving thrombolytics, you may end up taking to cath lab a patient who is not the right patient. So always confirm the name, confirm the time and date is very important. Date of birth, because there are some ECGs. For example, if I see some peak T waves in a 25 year old young man with no chest pain, no diabetes, hypertension, I will not be worried. But if a 70 year old person or 60 year old with diabetes comes with a peak T wave, I'll extremely be worried. So age is very important. Look at the indication. Why is it being indicated? What is the reason for doing the ECG? Um, I haven't put the slide, but I'll briefly tell you the indications for ECG. One, chest pain. And it does not mean all kind of chest pain. And that's why the first thing is history, physical examination. You take your history. Is this chest pain looking like what you call angina or is it a typical chest pain? So the, one of the indication for ECG is uh, chest pain. Two, if you are suspecting infarction, ischemia, or you want to rule out coronary artery disease. Three, if you are suspecting like imbalance, a patient, for example, had taken last six for very long, they came confused, most likely they have hypokalemia, a patient has been given laxative, he or she has diarrhea or vomited a lot, so I'm suspecting electrolyte imbalance because it will tell me a lot of things. Number three, patients who present, or number three, yeah, the patients who present with palpitations because ECG is 100 years old. Yet again, there is no other tool that is yet to replace ECG. It will always remain with us. For example, you cannot, with capital letter, talk of myocardial infarction without an ECG. There is nothing else on this earth that will tell you am I without an ECG, period. There is nothing else that will tell you atrial fibrillation except an ECG. There is nothing else that will tell you left bundle branch block, for which, by the way, uh, cardiac devices like CRT is indicated a special type of pacemaker, except an ECG. So ECG is very important when it comes to arrhythmias. So arrhythmias, chest pain, electrolyte imbalance, if you are suspecting toxicity of certain drugs like digoxin, so on and so forth, uh, pre-op evaluation of patients who have got high risk factors, those are the patients immune to do ECG. And there are three types of ECG. One is what you call resting ECG, is what we are discussing right now. A patient comes, you put him on the bed, you do the ECG, that is called resting ECG. Then we have what you call exercise ECG, the so-called EST, exercise stress test, where you are put on an ECG on your chest, but you run on a treadmill, trying to look for ischemia. Then the third type of ECG is what you call halter monitoring or ambulatory ECG. So if a patient has got palpitation long-standing, we don't know what kind of palpitation it is, 
or a patient has got syncope, we don't know whether it's neurogenic or cardiac so on and so forth, we usually put on them an ECG, we call it Holter monitor. And those are the patients we usually like. Um, uh, those are the patients we like putting them on a Holter monitor. So those are the three types of ECG. So those two slides I forgot to put, but I'll try to put them one, indication for ECG, and number two, the types of ECG. So going back to the interpretations, always check the name, time and date, date of birth of the patient or age of the patient, indications. And then finally, is there any previous ECG? This one is extremely important because just to give you an example, there is something called left bundle branch block. If a patient never had left bundle branch block, he brought you his ECGs last month, the previous year, whatever, there was never any left bundle branch block. Then today he presents with chest pain plus new onset left bundle branch block, that patient must be treated like as if he's having STEMI. We call it STEMI equivalent. So new onset left bundle branch block is considered as STEMI equivalent. So that's why comparison to previous ECG is very important. Now, after you have checked all those things, the next thing you look at is the calibration. And this is the point I was telling you, calibration. You look down the, below the rhythm strip, down there, there is a point where they indicate the numbers, 25 millimeters per second, 10 millivolts per millimeter, blah, 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 blah. That's called calibration because that's what you will use to now interpret the ECG. Now, after you have done that, you always approach ECG in a very systematic manner. You start with the red, go to the rhythm axis, then you look at the individual waves. Previously, previously, uh, we used to say red rhythm axis, then you go to chamber enlargement, you go to conduction blocks, you go to arrhythmias, you go ST segment changes, and then you do miscellaneous. But now things have changed. How has it changed? You do red, you do rhythm, you do axis, then you go to individual waves. You go to the P wave on a Malizana Nile. How is the P wave? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it biphasic? Is it tall? Is it broad? Is it notched? Then you finish. You move to the PR segment. Is it depressed? Is it high? Is it short? You move on to the PR interval. Is it prolonged? Is it short? You go to the QRS, QT, ST, T wave, U wave, and you finish the ECG like that. But the first three remains always standard. You start with the red, you look at the rhythm, you look at the axis, then you go to the individual waves. So today we'll do these first three, and then we'll stop there to answer any questions. We'll start with the red. Now, um, the first thing is you calculate the red. The next thing you look at the rhythm, and then you look at the axis. So this is what I was telling you. You look at the red, go to the rhythm axis, then you go to the individual uh, waves. And this one we'll do in the next session from P wave all, all, all the way down. But today we'll finish with this uh, first three. We start with the red. Now you remember what I told you about the horizontal. Horizontal is the time. And I told you one large box represents 0 0.2 second. One small box, which makes up five, which makes five small boxes make up one large box. Each small box represents 0 0.04 second. And here I'm talking of the standard ECG and the calculation came from 25 millimeters per second. If you calculate backwards, you can represent how much time is represented by one small box. And because of that background, this is how you calculate. This is what I was telling you, the reference, 10 millimeters per millivolt amplitude time. This we have already talked about it. Now, when you look at an ECG strip, when you get, when you print out and then you cut that paper, that paper, we call it a 10 second strip. In fact, if you calculate the number of small boxes from the beginning to the end, it's exactly 10 seconds. So what you do, what you do, there are three ways of determining heart rate. And before we go to that, I want to tell you something like, you first look, and throw a glance at the ECG in front of you to ask yourself whether this ECG is regular or not. Regular means it. For example, this is regular, 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 because this distance is constant. The distance between one R wave to another, to another, to another is the same. So if the heart rate is regular, now there are three ways of determining, two ways of determining the rate. Number one, what you do is you count how many boxes, large boxes, this is a large box, is falling between two R waves. I'll give you an example. For example, this one is falling on one grid line and another one on a grid line. 
the number of boxes, large boxes between two R wave is one and two. And therefore the rate will be 300 divided by two. That will give me a rate of 150. So I will repeat it again. The number of large boxes, I'm talking of how to determine rate in an ECG and how to de determine rate in an ECG. One, you count the number of large boxes that fall between two R waves. And here we are using the rhythm strip, the strip that runs down at the bottom of the Any two R waves determine the number of boxes, large boxes between them, and you divide that number by two, 300. 300 divided by two. If there are three large boxes, 300 divided by three. If there are four large boxes, 300 divided by six. For example, this upper ECG, if you can see it clearly, this is one R wave, this is another one R wave. So I have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven large boxes that is happening or occurring between two R waves. So I'll divide 300 divided by seven and it will come to like around 45 bits per minute. The one below I showed you, there is one R wave here, there's another R wave here. In between there are two large boxes. So the rate will be 300 divided by two, which is 150. Okay, now, so that is one method. 300 divided by the number of large boxes that's occurring between two R waves. The second method is more or less the same, but this time instead of dividing, dividing by large boxes, you count the number of small boxes that are happening between two R waves. And that one you divide by 1500. And there's a reason why we pick the, why the number 300, 5, 1500, but we'll not go back into mathematics uh, right now. Because the logic is very simple. If one small box represents 0 0.04 second and one minute contains 60 seconds, how do I come to calculate that? So it is 60 divided by 0 0.04, which gives me 1500. On the other hand, if one large box represents 0 0.2 seconds, and I'm interested in the bits per minute, that's what I'm interested in, which is the rate, and a minute is 60 seconds. So if one large box is represented, representing 0 0.2 seconds, 60 seconds will be represented by how many large boxes? And that's where the figure 300 came. I don't know if I'm making sense, because, because 60 divided by 0 0.02 will give you 300 seconds. I mean 300. So 300 divided by the number of large boxes will give you the heart rate, or 1500 divided by the number of small boxes will give you the heart rate again. And the 1500 came from the same logic. If one small box represents 0 0.04 seconds, 60 seconds, which is one minute, will be represented by how many small boxes? So 60 divided by 0 0.04 will give you 1500. Either way, whichever method you use, you'll still get bits per minute. These two methods you use if the heart rate is regular. The third method which you can use still when the heart rate is regular is you go to the rhythm strip below. I told you one large paper when you print out an Naoki Kata, you have it in your hand, represents 10 seconds. And for me to get one minute, it will be 10 seconds times six, which gives me 60 seconds. So what I will do is that that large rhythm strip, which is down there, I'll just count the number of QRX complexes, one, two, three, four, five, da, 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 like that. Whatever number of QRX complexes I get, I multiply by six, and that will give you my heart rate. Now, if the heart rhythm is irregular, in other words, there is a Q wave here, QRS, then you go, you miss the distance shortening, increasing, shortening, increasing, like in the case of atrial fibrillation. Now you use the latter method, which I have just discussed. So you'll go to the rhythm strip, count the number of QRS complexes, and multiply by, 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 by six. And that will give you the number of the heart rate. This is what I've already described, where the RR interval, you divide by the number of large boxes, if the number of large boxes are two, the rate is 1500, 150, sorry. If there are three, it's 100, 475, 560, it goes like that. So the first thing after you have checked the name of the 
patient date of birth, you have confirmed this, the right ECG for this patient, you looked at the calibration is to determine the rate. And the rate, you look at the regularity. If it's regular, you use the number of large boxes, you divide by 300, or the number of small boxes between two arrows and divide by 1500. Or if you are lazy enough and you want to move very fast, you just count the number of QRS complexes in the rhythm strip and multiply by six. Now, the result you get will either be normal, which is between 60 to 100. If it's below 50, we call it bradycardia. We are not using the word sign as still. We are just using the terminology bradycardia. If it's more than 100, we call it tachycardia, period. So bradycardia, tachycardia. Now you will add the issue of sinus or not. If, for example, the patient, after we have gone to the rhythm, this one I'm jumping because it's using the pacemaker business. There's also something called the six second rule. Applicated, the most important thing is the six second, basically what it means is you can actually calculate until it is more or less like the rule of 10, which I've already explained. And this is what I was telling the rate. For example, this is a QRS complex and this is a QRX complex. And these two QRX complexes, sorry, the number of large boxes between the two is one, two, three, four, five. So 300 divided by five will give me 60. So the rate of this patient is 60 bits per minute. If you want to use the small boxes, because this is for the large boxes, you multiply, you divide by 1500 by the number of small boxes following between two uh, QRS complexes. That is for rate. The next thing to determine is the rhythm. Now, just again, here what you are interested in is the normal rhythm. The normal rhythm is sinus rhythm. Why do you call it sinus? It's because the pacemaker is sinoatrial node. It means it's originating from the natural pacemaker of the heart, which is the sinoatrial node, hence the name sinus rhythm. And it, pass, it passes through a normal flow, which is the sinoatrial node, AV node, his bundle, bundle branches, Purkinje fiber, all the way to the myocardium. Anything outside that is called arrhythmia, whether it is sinus arrhythmia or the other types of arrhythmias. So what we are discussing about here is the, 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 the rhythm. Now, there are three important criteria, take home message in rhythm. Number one, every QRS must be preceded by a P wave. That's rule number one, because for us to call it sinus rhythm, it must originate in the sinoatrial node. And what denotes sinoatrial node is the P wave. It is only after the P wave has been generated, the atria has contracted, the electricity has been a little bit stopped at the AV node that will QRS come. So if there is no P wave before QRS, that is not sinus rhythm. So rule number one, every QRS must be preceded by a P wave. Number two, the P wave must be positive, meaning it is above the isoelectric line in lib two. So if it is inverted, if it is not there, or if it is coming after the QRS, that is not sinus. So rule number one, every QRS must be preceded by a P wave. Every P wave must be positive in lib two. If you have those two, then you have sinus rhythm. Now, if I have sinus rhythm by my rate is lower than 60, I will call it sinus bradycardia. If I have sinus rhythm, but my heart rate is all, uh, more than 100, I will call it sinus tachycardia. Now you can add the word sinus because it has fulfilled these other two criteria. As you can see here, we have got PQRS, PQRS. So every QRS must be preceded by a P wave. And in lead two, this P wave must be looking upward. That's what I mean by P positive P wave. And this is exactly what I mean. So I have got a QRS complex preceded by a P wave. Every QRS, there's a P wave in front of it. And this P wave, for me to know that it's a sinus, it must be positive in lead two. Okay? And you can have different types of, so anything outside that, it's called arrhythmia. And these are the various types of arrhythmias. We'll have a topic on its own, so don't worry about it. Just to give you an example, this thing, why we call it atrial fibrillation and not sinus rhythm is because there is no P wave. There is no P wave visible. All this you are seeing is called a chaotic rhythm. We call it fibrillary waves. 
These are not P waves. Since every QRS is not preceded, preceded by a P wave, it is not sinus rhythm. The same thing with here. Somebody can say, oh, but we are seeing very many P waves. No, it's supposed to be one to one. One QRS, one P wave. One QRS, one P wave. If you have got several P waves in front of a QRS, that is not sinus. So the rule number one was, every QRS must be preceded by a P wave. There must be one-to-one -one conduction, meaning the atria contracts, the ventricle contracts. The atria contracts, the ventricle contracts. But like in this case of atrial fibrillation, the atria is contracting on its own irregularly, like that in a tetemeca. So there are so many contractions of the atria, and because it's not sinus rhythm. So the three rules of sinus is one, every P QRS must be preceded by a P wave. There must be a one-to-one -one conduction. And finally, every P wave must be posted in lib two. For example, this is junctional. Why is it junctional? Like this QRS, there is no P wave in front of it. Or even if you argue there is QRS, it's not positive. This is lib two. It's not positive, it's negative. Meaning it's coming from somewhere else. Like here, the P wave is here. This is something a bit deep for you guys, but you will understand with time. The P wave is coming after the QRS. Because it's coming after the QRS, that cannot be sinus rhythm, okay? So these are different types of arrhythmias. So anything outside the normal sinus conduction system is called arrhythmia. It can be all the way from atrial fibrillation to hemiblocks, so on, to ventricular fibrillation, to ventricular tachycardia, to sardepoir, whatever it is, so on and so forth. So sinus rhythm, the P wave must be upright in lead two. And this is what I mean by upright. It's looking up. As I said, each Q wave must be preceded by, by, by a P wave. And it's supposed to be a one-to-one -one conduction. And for us to talk about now, you add the word rate. If it's normal rate, that's fine. If it is below 60, we call it sinus bradycardia. If it's for that, more than that, call it um, sinus tachycardia. Then in the next 10 minutes, because I'm about to finish my first session, is about axis. Now this one will, will really, really confuse a lot of you guys. And inshallah, hopefully one time when we meet physically, I'll explain it better. But basically axis means the way electricity flows in the heart. All of you know very well that the, the heart is usually positioned a little bit towards the left side of the body. So where the axis, I mean the apex is, that's where it's directed. For those who watch football, you know that football has 12 team member. Then there's a goalkeeper. The aim of all these 11 member team in that particular group, I mean team, the purpose is to score a goal in the other side. So one person kicks, one person kicks the ball, they give to each other. Every time the ball is kicked, the distance of being kicked is increased until such a time we score a goal. Now the same thing in the heart, the purpose of sending electricity all the way is to make sure that electricity reaches the left ventricle because that's the most important chamber in the body. Why? Because it's the one that pumps blood to the whole body. Because it's the one that pumps blood to the whole body as far as the foot in the toe, the toe in the foot, it should have a thicker muscle. It usually uses a lot of energy. It has a lot of power. And therefore the axis is directed towards the apex. In other words, usually the normal axis, because the axis is basically a combination of all the vectors and vectors is the flow of that electricity. So the ventral axis is usually directed in the, in the quadrant between the left arm and the left side of the body, that quadrant. So that when you draw a triangle, let me go back if I can demonstrate something here. Yes, so let me use this gentleman here. When you draw it like this, quadrant, left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. And then you draw something like a circle like this. So the normal axis of the heart is directed here where my arrow is, because this is where the apex of the heart is. So all the electricity is supposed to flow in this direction because it's the one that has the largest amount of muscles and most of the electricity is pu being pulled away by that. So anything, Outside this quadrant, we call it axis deviation. 
If it is outside the left arm, we call it left axis deviation. If it's outside the right, towards the right side of the body, we call it right axis deviation. So this right axis deviation, this is normal axis, this is left axis deviation, and this is called extreme axis deviation, okay? So how do you determine axis? There are several ways you can determine axis, but I want to, take, to give you the easiest and the simplest. For you to understand axis, the most important thing is you just lead, look at two leads, only two leads, lead one and lead AVF. So quickly, if you don't have time and you really, really want to understand the axis of, uh, of an ECG, you just look at two leads. Let's start with lead one. If your lead one is looking upwards like this, is overly positive, meaning this is the isoelectric line and the whole of this is above it. And also your lead AVF is also positive. In other words, both of them are looking up. That's a normal axis. But if your lead one is looking down, then you have right axis deviation. If your AVF is looking down, you may have, here it's not like right axis deviation, right axis deviation 100%. If your right lead one is looking down 100%, you have right axis deviation. There is no two way about it. But if you have a negative AVF, meaning your AVF is looking down, it's good to confirm with lead two because lead two and lead three are called inferior leads. We'll discuss this when we talk about acute coronary syndrome. They are called inferior leads. So lead two, three and AVF are called inferior leads because they look at the lower part of the heart. And since AVF is one of the leads that look from the bottom of the heart, you confirm with what you call the contiguous lead a neighboring lead, a lead that also looks at the same part of the heart. So if both of them are looking downwards, then you are 100% confirm left axis deviation. So let me repeat it. If both your lead one and AVF are looking up, you have a normal axis. If your right axis is looking, I mean, right, uh, sorry, the lead one is looking down, you have right axis deviation. If you have lead AVF looking down, it's always good to confirm with lead two. So that if lead two is also looking down, then you have confirmed left axis deviation. Now, what is the purpose of this axis? Um, let me just show you. So what is the purpose of the left axis deviation? What, what, what is the logic behind it? Why do you have to uh, look at axis? Because the differential diagnosis of an axis deviation is very important. It will help you. If I give you an example, a patient, let's say comes, um, for example, difficult in breathing, desaturating, a lady who just underwent cesarean section, et cetera, et cetera. And then I did an ECG very fast. I found her sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia means there is P wave before every QRS, but the rate is more than hundred. And therefore she has sinus tachycardia. But in addition to sinus tachycardia, I see this kind of axis deviation, right axis deviation. Because of the history I have, this patient was delivered some few weeks ago through cesarean section. Now she comes with difficulty in breathing, chest pain. I do ECG because one of the indications for chest pain was ECG. Ha, now her ECG has what? Sinus tachycardia. But in addition to that, right axis deviation, I can bet 100% this patient has PE. You see how axis helps now. So axis deviation is a differential diagnosis. And I'll share with you the mnemonics uh, probably in the next session so that you can remember what are the differential diagnosis of right axis deviation? What are the differential diagnosis of left axis deviation? For example, right axis, right axis deviation, PE can cause pulmonary hypertension can cause any problem in the lungs, chronic pulmonary diseases can cause, right ventricular hypertrophy can cause pulmonary stenosis, anything that hypertrophies the right ventricle or strains the right ventricle will deviate the axis to the right. And uh, I will have demonstrated to you the reason why it, why it deviates, but hopefully when we meet physically, I'll be able to explain to you. I think I'll stop here uh, so that if there are any questions, we'll be able to answer. Today, so we covered basically basics of ECG. I urge you again to go to the words and look at those ECGs. And I want you to understand the anatomy of the paper of the ECG. Those timings, horizontal and vertically, what do they mean? You look at the name, the date, the indications, so on and so forth. 
After the calibration, you go to the rate and rate you determine using those three methods which I have described to you. And then you go to the rhythm, the three rules which I've already mentioned to you, and you look at the axis. Axis, you look at lead one, AVF. If both of them are positive, you just say normal axis. If one of them right uh, lead one is negative, right axis. If lead AVF is negative, just throw your eyes at lead, uh, lead two. If it's also negative, you have confirmed left axis deviation. I think I'll stop here and uh, I'll ask members now participants if there's any question. Any question, any comment? Amato <laughs> Melala. Uh, to Jalala Bado, but um, we give people a couple of minutes just to gather their questions. Okay. Some of these things is good to explain uh, physically in terms of demonstration, they stick better, but uh, I just hope now the um, sound team will be able to organize for that. I know there was a logistics issue. Inshallah, we'll be able to cover all of them one by one very slowly because I really want you guys to grasp this thing. There's a lot of inadequacy when it comes to ECG, especially in University of Nairobi. Even for those guys who are doing our masters with, they had a deficiency in ECG. And uh, it's a very, very important tool because unfortunately we are losing a lot of patients in the county hospitals because the healthcare workers, MOs, MO interns are unable to interpret or perform an ECG. And it's something I think uh, basically if you develop interest in it, it will really, really help you also later on. Um, so, so far, I have one question and a uh, lot of people thanking you. So um, the question, the first question is, how do you check for extreme access deviation? Yeah, so that's a good question. There is one which I didn't talk about it because I didn't want to dwell. Let me just show you again that, that Muse, the man. So when you look at it, um, this is lead. So when you have got left axis deviation, as I told you, lead AVF and lead two will be negative. So this is where we are talking about this left axis deviation. This is our normal axis. This is right axis deviation and this extreme axis deviation. So extreme axis deviation is a combination of left and right. And therefore, AVF will be negative, lead two will be negative and lead one will be negative. In other words, all of them, lead one, lead two, and AVF will all be negative. And that's what you call extreme axis deviation. Some other people call it the Northwest Territory. And this is seen in some few conditions, people who are extremely tall, people who have got emphysematous conditions like emphysema, they usually get extreme axis deviation. So that's how you'll diagnose extreme axis deviation. It's a combination of both LAD and RAD combined, and therefore lead one, lead two, AVF will all be negative, meaning they are looking down, meaning they are below the electric isoelectric line. Hi, Sawasawa. Um, next question says, uh, it's asking you to elaborate what happens when there's bundle blocks left or right. So we'll discuss that in, uh, in arrhythmias or we'll, no, we'll discuss in the next session, which will be about the waves when we are discussing the QRS complexes. So uh, I don't want to preempt, but basically bundle branch block can, ha can happen at all the bundle, at, at all the branches. In other words, you can have a right bundle branch block, meaning the right bundle branch is the one that is blocked. So what it means that electricity first goes to the left ventricle through the left bundle branch. And by the time it reaches the left ventricle, when a kumbuka, eh, our right has not contracted, meaning the, branch, the bundle is blocked. Therefore, we send electricity back to the right ventricle. So there's something called desynchrony. In other words, the two ventricles are not contracting at the same time. And you can pick that from ECG very comfortably. And you will see how that happens. 
The same thing with a left bundle. So if you have a left bundle branch, you can have the left bundle branch block or a block in the sub branches of the left bundle, which are called the fascicles. So you can have left bundle branch block or what you call hemi blocks. Hemi blocks is either anterior fascicle block or posterior fascicular block. And when that happens also, what happens is that electricity first goes to the right side, then after that it's activated backwards onto the left side. Now left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block, when you compare, LBB is more important clinically because somebody can develop heart failure because of LBB and is one of the ways, one of the ways of treating a patient who has heart failure second to left bundle branch block is by putting a special pacemaker, which is called biventricular pacing or also called CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy. So you can pick all those things from the ECG, but we'll discuss inshallah when we come to the QRS complexes. Okay, inshallah. Um, so there's someone asking, are there ECG or ECHO short certificate courses available? Um, ECG for now, no, but ECHO, there are some guys who have started, Kidogo, there's a, little, a bit of politics involved. And uh, for example, uh, uh, Kenya Cardiac Society wants to organize a task force that specifically deals with cardiac imaging, pre preferentially with, uh, with, uh, with, especially in the setting of echo. But I know some other cardiologists have started giving some echo courses. Um, but more important than echo for you guys at this level, what I want you to concentrate more on is ECG. And at the end of the sessions or in between the sessions, I'll be able to share with you some very, very nice websites that gives you the basics of ECG all the way to complex interpretation of how to interpret ECG. Uh, you can also learn about what you call mnemonics. For example, if you want to remember right axis deviation, there's a mnemonic, which I'll be able to share in the slides, uh, maybe at this session or next session. Uh, but I am not sure if there's a specific ECG course certificate. I don't think there is any existing. Last week, part one, was it last week or two weeks ago, Kenya Cardiac Society organized for an ECG workshop, but that was geared towards MOs and physicians mostly, rather than uh, medical students. We, are, we want to see if we can work with the university institutions and set up a training on basically ECGs because that's, that's an area people are poor of. But right now, because you guys have a lot of access to digital health, once you can have access to those digital ECG libraries, then every day, every day, make sure you just grasp one ECG, just go through it, start with the basics. You have a lot of time. And once you learn the grasp, the basics and the logic behind it, then ECG will be a walk in the park. Okay, so, so um, somebody is asking, in case of lower limb amputation below the knee, where do you place the lid? So actually, uh, when we say the limb list, it does not necessarily mean that you should put it on below the knee. You can even put it on the torso, you know, where the flank area is. So just watch when people are nurses are doing ECG. So it depends on the kind of ECG you have. Some of them are clips, some of them they are adhesive pads, some of them they are electrode adhesive uh, uh, dots. So there are different types of formats of ECG. So even if somebody is amputated, even above knee, it doesn't matter. You can put it on the flank so long as it is on that side of the body and it is below the, the rib cage. Because once you come onto the rib cage, you are talking of precordial leads. You are no longer talking of, uh, you are no longer talking of uh, uh, the limb leads. So you can put it anywhere so long as the orientation is very clear in your head. Sometimes when you go to ICU, there are some leads which you put for monitoring purposes. Those ones, the way they are put is different. Mostly they use the limb leads, those ones. We don't use the chest leads. And the codings are usually standard. It's red, yellow, green, and brown or black, depending on how many leads you are using. So you can have five, you can have three, you can have 12, you can have 10. You can even have 15, you can have 18 electrodes. You can even have 24. So long as you know where you are putting, where is your lead looking at? Because if you want to diagnose posterior MI, you have to put posterior leads. If you want to diagnose right ventricular MI, you have to put on the right chest, not the left. So you play around with the leads where to place, but even if somebody is amputated, you can still put limb leads. And when the ECG is generated, it will show you the format I have showed you. One, two, three on one line, AVR, AVLF one line, 
then V1 to V6 on the other lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so there's someone who's asking to share the mnemonic for right and left axis division, but in the next session. Yeah, that I'll be able to share with you. So, um, so um, last question, why do we use lead two mainly to interpret? So that that I wish I uh, that's why I said I wish I could demonstrate to you. But basically, lead two is here. This is lead two. Are you seeing the slide? Yes. So this is lead two. I, I don't know if you guys remember in mathematics there was something that used to be called translation. I don't know if it's still there. So you translate this graph. Translation means you move it from where it is. Lead two usually the negative is the right arm. The positive is in the left leg. So when you translate, you move it this way. And that's what translation means in mathematics. Now, why lead two is because you remember the sinuatri node is located here where my arrow is and electricity flows in this direction. And you can see it is the only lead that is parallel to the electric flow of the long axis of the heart. And therefore it is the most appropriate rhythm strip because it's basically running parallel to the electric flow along the long axis of the heart because this is where the sinoatrial load is located and it sends electricity downward like this towards the apex. And lead two is here, it's also parallel. And therefore it is the best in, uh, way, way of depicting the rhythm in terms of, you will not be able to miss anything from the P wave all the way to the U wave. That's why we prefer. But as I said, but there are a lot of other companies that use V1, V5 as their rhythm strip. But most of the leasages you'll see they are using lead two as a rhythm strip. Okay, so same person is asking, when should we check the other leads? Um, I, I'm not getting exactly the question, when do we check the other leads? But generally speaking, it depends on what you're looking for and the context in which you are. For example, if, if, I'm, if a patient, I palpated his or her pulse and I found it irregular, my interest is just the P wave. Is there a P wave present? and the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation period. If a patient has got chest pain, I have to look at all the leads individually, anterior leads, inferior leads, posterior leads like that, because I want to know which artery is blocked. If a patient tells me, for example, the example I gave you, a lady who delivered cesarean section comes with dyspnea, she's cyanotic, she's breathless, blah, blah, blah. I will only look at lead one and lead V, lead V1. V1 and lead one. So the leads you look at depends on the clinical context. But at this particular stage, I advise you, you follow that system so that you don't miss anything. You can take your sweet time. If there is an emergency, there's no much time. You just look at the rate very fast, the rhythm very fast axis, and then you look at the individual wave you are interested in. So no lead is superior to the other, but the rhythm strip gives us a lot of information regarding the rhythm specifically and for the particular waves. But all the other leads, you have to look at them depending on the clinical context. Okay, um, so last question is uh, lead one same as V1? No, no, it's different. So when we say lead one, lead two, lead three is the bipolar limb leads. And they are not written in, not Arabic number, it's written in Roman number. Just the way HIV, you remember stage one, stage two, stage three, we write in Roman number. So lead one, lead two, lead three is totally different from V1, V2, V3. The one, the V1, V2, V3 are called precordial leads or chest leads. Some old ECGs, they use the letter C. So that one, you mean C1, C2, C3. But when we usually say lead one, we are talking of lead one on its own, not V1. They are totally different. So this is what I meant by lead one. It's written like this. And the ECG, this is how it's represented. So this is lead one and this is V1, they are different. This one is written in usual Roman number, but these ones are written in Arabic number, as you can see, V1, V2, V3, and they have the letter V or C depending on the ECG. So I think we can stop there if, unless there is a burning question. If there's any other question, probably we can postpone to the next session. Okay, um, just one last question. Um, yes. Do each V leads 
read a particular part of the heart? Yes, so we'll discuss in more detail, but just to give you a small hint, um, lead two, lead three, and AVF are called inferior leads, but we'll lead V1, V2, they are called septal or anterior leads. V3, V4, V5, V6 are called lateral leads. So there's anterior, inferior, lateral. Those are the main ones which are represented on the 12 lead ECG. And you'll find somebody on a chukwa and ECG and a sema, eh, you had a mail before, yeah. It was it RCA, yes. So you wonder what is this guy reading? Kumbe is just looking at which lead has a Q wave and which artery is infected. You can confer from there. That's why when you say this patient has inferior MI, his left circumflex is, is blocked, blah, blah, blah. So each lead, two, three leads are looking at the same place. And those are called contiguous leads. And they become very significant when you talk of MIs and those kind of things. Um, okay, so there's one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, kindly repeat how to check for right axis deviation. So this is how you look at right axis deviation. Uh, I'll go exactly to where the point was. So basically for axis, I told you, you only look at lead one and AVF. For right axis deviation, you concentrate on lead one. Normally lead one is supposed to be positive. It's supposed to be looking up. If you see lead one looking down, in other words, it's below this isoelectric line. Like in this case, that's how you confirm right axis deviation. So a negative lead one tells you that there is right axis deviation. I think that's that's the last question. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much and. Uh, if there are any other questions, probably you can collect and then maybe we'll allow five minutes before we start the next session um, to, to, to be able to answer those questions. And inshallah, one of these fine days, if we can meet physically so that I can demonstrate all those things, especially the axis and the leads, how it's placed on the limbs and so forth. And then we can come with a physical ECG so that we show you those things I've been talking about theoretically. Otherwise, I wish you all the best and I add you just whenever you get a chance, just read as many ECGs as possible. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. So, inshallah. Thank you. Okay, good night.